Good morning. Um, we're talking about Trinity being in transition. And this conversation came up at the West Berks Mission District Council meeting. And um, I said, you know, you don't have to worry about Trinity. I said, people get along, we work together, we have a lot of committed people. Um, Trinity may be in transition, but that's nothing to worry about. This is something good that is happening for us. So as a chunk, as a congregation in transition, uh, we're still doing the same things that we've been doing for a while. And you all know that we adopted 10th and Penn a number of years ago. Um, we now have a principal at 10th and Penn who belongs there, who belongs to us. And she told me that this is my school last year when she was placed finally after the first of the year. So we know that we have somebody we can depend on. She is going to be good, folks. She's doing her job, and perhaps in time we can have her come and speak to us about the changes that have taken place there. We collect coats for the children. We buy them uniforms. We buy any kind of clothing they need. We buy school supplies. These are some of the things that we do at 10th and Penn. But the most important thing, I think, is the fact that we volunteer and work directly with the children. We are in need of volunteers. We're getting our program together for this year. So I hope that if you have any interest at all, you will let me know. And if you do, you can go along to the meeting that we normally have with the principal to hear what she has to say and so forth. Uh, it does not mean you're committed to teaching if you're interested and you just want to go along and see what is it supposed to be about. You can ask me any questions that you might have. I've been doing this about five years. Um, so I'll be happy to share it with you. Remember that, you know, to those whom God gives much, he expects much. We at this congregation have been given much, and we know that. And this is one way that you can show how grateful you are to him for sharing the talents he has given you with someone else. Thank you. Almighty and eternal God, 
you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowners, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. If you Google the phrase day laborers, you will get north of 800,000 responses. Have you ever seen this phenomenon working? Do you know what it is? Often, but not exclusively, there are people who will gather, usually around dawn, in a parking lot. It could be Lowe's, it could be Home Depot, it could be somewhere else and they gather looking for day work. Landscapers, sometimes movers, sometimes people in construction. They have identified the place to go through word of mouth. Everybody who needs to know seems to know where you have to go. A truck pulls up, the driver gets out, brief conversation here and there, and maybe he points to three or four of these fellows and they get in the truck and they're hired for the day. It's a common enough practice, one that sort of operates in the shadows. And it may or may not be legal. Even 2,000 years ago, this way of hiring people was so widespread that Jesus uses that practice to make a point about the kingdom of God. The landowner is looking for laborers in the vineyard. He hires early in the morning for the usual wage. Then he goes back again at nine o'clock. I will pay you whatever is right. 
and yet again at noon and three and five o'clock. And each of those three times, there's even less specificity about what the wage might be. And then the outrageous surprise. And let me just say, you're going to hear the word outrageous in the next few minutes often enough. And I want to have you understand, in our day-to-day -day conversation, oftentimes outrageous has a negative connotation. There is a definition of outrageous that's not negative, and that's the one I want to use today. Extraordinary, unconventional, likely to surprise or shock. There is this outrageous surprise. Payment is made to all five groups, and all are paid the same. And in response, there is this grumbling. Those who worked all day are clear in their displeasure. These last only worked one hour. You have made them equal to us. The landowner justifies his behavior, says he's done no wrong. He paid the first group what they agreed to. Isn't this what we said? The usual daily wage. And then this highly provocative question. Are you envious? Because I am generous. Literally, literally the text, is your eye evil? Because I am good. Or put into the way we might talk, really? Really? Do you see evil because I'm good? It's an ancient sore point. It's an echo of the, this morning's first lesson. Jonah, unhappy because God doesn't give the people of Nineveh what they deserve. Or better said, God doesn't give the people of Nineveh what Jonah thinks they deserve. So, as is common with the parables of Jesus, a practice that is common knowledge among the people is effectively turned on its head and illustrates the truth of the kingdom. The parable starts with the words that Jesus uses oh so often, the kingdom of heaven is life. So Jesus is being descriptive. The kingdom is a place where people, thank God, are treated equally, but not equally in the manner that we might expect. The equality of the kingdom is the equality that is born of the gifts of salvation and forgiveness and eternal life. The equality of the kingdom is the reality that indeed no one gets what they deserve because no one deserves the gifts of God. In fact, this equality of the kingdom is at the heart of the gospel, nothing less than the equality of the love of God for all the children of God. Jesus, then, is not being prescriptive. This parable is not a map of how to run a business nor is it a model that will be implemented in our sinful world. A world that seems to have increasing difficulty reconciling economic practices and justice. But there are other sermons to preach on that topic. Here, Jesus draws a distinction between the kingdom, all are treated equally, and this world. The belief that people should get what they deserve. The parable transcends economic policy. There is no wonder that the laborers who worked in the field all day grumble. They didn't get what they thought they deserved. If that's ever happened to you, you might have grumbled when you didn't get what you thought you deserved. But look at the parable from another angle. The parable is silent about the reaction of those who worked only a short time. Matthew doesn't tell us anything about that. Jesus doesn't tell us anything about that. Those who received far more than the others thought they deserved. It's 
it's often a challenge to determine who we might identify with in a parable. But this morning, let me suggest that we identify with those who work the shortest amount of time. Just for a moment, be one of them. You only went out into the vineyard at five o'clock. You only worked an hour. And amazingly enough, you were paid the full daily wage equal to what everybody else got that day. Do we fully grasp the radical nature of what God has done? Do we understand the magnitude of the gift? Do we understand the depth of God's generosity? And do we understand that indeed we do not, thankfully, get what we deserve? Did you hear the absolution from the confession this morning? God forgives your every debt, your every sin, and gives you a new heart and a new spirit. Many years ago, a young man sat in my office and told me he wanted to do something for people who were economically challenged. He had a business that, to say the least, had been very successful. He was, one might say, rich. He felt blessed. And he sat in my office and he told me all these things. He said, I have a lot of money. And for a young guy, he did have a lot of money. And I want to do something. What can I do? So I told him about some of the things the congregation was involved in. Maybe he could work in the soup kitchen, or maybe he could make a generous donation to the soup kitchen, or maybe the homeless shelter, which needed a whole lot of renovations, could benefit from his generosity, and he could maybe help the, home, the homeless shelter to be a little better place for the people who had to stay there. In other words, I gave him the suggestions you might expect. None of the suggestions appealed to him. And he left my office, and I suspect left my office a bit disappointed. And after he was gone, I concluded that I aimed too low. He reappeared a few weeks later. And this time he didn't have any questions. He simply wanted to tell me what he had done. He had rented a van, gone to a supermarket, filled it with groceries, then drove into the most economically challenged community he could think of, parked, threw open the doors of the van, and invited people to take what they wanted. This he said he would do periodically, on no particular schedule, but simply as the Spirit moved him. Now, rationally, we could certainly argue that such a practice might be ill-advised. We might argue that there were better ways to get food into the hands of people who needed it. Certainly, we might agree that this practice that he initiated would never, ever be widely adopted by the institutional church. But at the same time, he taught me something. The outrageous love of God, as expressed in this outrageous gospel parable, sometimes creates in people the need to express that love in what? Bold print, italics, highlighted, underlined, bigger font, loudly. Perhaps even do something in a manner that we might call outrageous. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is like like what? Jesus describes a place where the constraints of this world are removed and the assumptions of this world are challenged. Heaven knows we are not there yet. 
but the church has always believed and always taught that such is the destination of the journey. Now we see dimly, then we will see clearly. And then maybe, maybe even understand this outrageous description of the kingdom of God, even where the last will be first and the first will be last. Amen. people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Generous God, you claim us as your own and your church declares your greatness. Bless and strengthen our bishops, Elizabeth and Sam. We pray for Christ Episcopal Church and for Father John, for the Congregation of Peace Lutheran Church and Pastor Robin, and for Trinity Deaf and Pastor Rick. Make all who serve you firm in one spirit. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. The goodness of your creation is a celebration of your mighty acts. Enable us to appreciate the smallest to the largest of wonders and to be faithful stewards of all your gifts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. People of all nations sing aloud of your righteousness. 
incite us to commit acts of peace, break down barriers, crush complacency, and stand up to intolerance. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Strengthen those who suffer, especially Beth, Kristen, Betty, Annabelle, Annie, Dorothy, Frank, Ralph, Andrea, David, Rodney and Dorothy, Tom, Pat, Joan, Brian, Bill, Jan Rita, and those we name before you now. Transform pain into purpose, sorrow into courage, fear into generosity, and loneliness into compassion. Hear us, O God. From the desire of our congregation to live as the body of Christ in the world, P place among us overflowing fonts and tables set as a feast for all people, and bless those whom we remember in prayer this week. Barbara and Virginia Achenbach, Kathy Babb, Michael, Corey, Mitch, D Dana, Joshua, and Kristen Barnett, and Jim and Amy Barrett. Hear us, O God. The lives of your saints are evidence of your salvation. Give meaning to all our days, then grant us peaceful deaths and unite us with those we love in praising your name. Hear us, O God. Trusting in your mercy and goodness, we bring before you these prayers and whatever else you see that we need. In the name of the one who sets us free, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. 